Well, hello, family. My name is Pastor Wesley Shell, and I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that we can meet you one Sunday morning here in Harrisburg, North Carolina at either our 9.15 or 11 a.m. service. But if not, if you're already attending a church or you live far away, listen, we believe in this Bible to be cover to cover truth, that it is still the inspired word of God. So I pray that the word of God would change you and make an impact on you and your family today. And would you give God praise one more time as you're seated today? being rabies on the stage, you talk about testimonies. How, how are you going to make it through that? You, what a beautiful day to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. There's no better place to be than the presence of the Lord and with family. We're so excited that you are here. I've got a couple of announcements that I want to hit before we jump into the word. The first one is that uh, Pastor Mike talked about being the old man in the office, and yes, he is the oldest, and he just got older by one year. We wanna celebrate his birthday. But I think through the past five years, you've been doing nothing, well, how long, Three, two years, it feels like five years, might be, it feels like 50 years, that you've just been getting younger. I really think that. I think he's aging in reverse these past few years. Look at him, he's so trendy, and uh, we're so grateful that you're here. I'm trying to catch up with him, that's my goal. Um, We're so grateful for him and his love and leadership. And if you haven't met him or you haven't met me, we would love to meet you. And we have the perfect opportunity to do that next week. Everybody say next week. Next week we have something that's called Party with the Pastors. And we have some snacks. Child care stays open. And we open the doors in this side room right here that we want to meet you. Share a little bit of our heart, our vision, the story of this church and also hear a little bit about yours because we don't wanna just do church together, we want to do life together, amen? Because that multiply, we the fam, we are family. You just didn't know it before you were here because you hadn't heard it yet, but I want to say welcome to the family. I want you to look to the person to your right and say, what's up, fam? Look to the person to your left, say, what's up, fam? Sup, because the younger they get, the more letters they take out of the words. That's just what they do. It went from what's up to what's up to sup. And we're here today, but no matter what kind of trendy language you use, you are family, and we're excited that you're here. One final thing, we have something that's uh, starting called Totally Kids. Uh, In September, we are launching this ministry. It's an opportunity for parents to drop their kids off for three hours, 8.30 to 11.30 on Tuesdays to Thursdays. So parents, if you're looking for some time away from your children, because let's be honest, we all need a little bit of that, uh, we have an opportunity for you. It's gonna be really cheap. Or if you're looking for some part-time work and you're like, you know what, I could do a a little something, uh, we are looking for people to be a part of that on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, starting in September. If you want any information on that as a parent or as a job, make sure and email rmiller at multiply.church. Rachel Miller is our kids pastor. She does an amazing job and she's going to be leading this up. And we're really excited for future opportunities of what this looks like of in the future when phase two happens of partnering with the coffee shop and moms being able to get together and uh, spend life with each other because it can get hard with kids. Um, I am not a stay-at-home mom, but I get to see it through the lens of my wife, and I know it's difficult not only dealing with me, but doing that. Um, So we want to give opportunities for them to walk together and also space for their kids to be watched in a safe place that is also going to teach them about the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray as we break open your word for the next few moments in chapter 9 of Romans that you would transform our minds like it says in Romans chapter 12 that we would look more like you and less like the world, that we would leave this place changed by your spirit and your power alone. And everybody said, amen. I, I hope you've had a great week. It's been a hot one once again, but we are so excited to continue our sermon series through the book of Romans. And we are now in chapter nine, so if you have a phone Bible or a paper Bible, we would love for you to open up there. And I'm reading from the NLT. Uh, there's no right or wrong reason, I just liked that one, so we'll be there. Our, our goal through this whole series has been to walk away with a transformed mind, like it says in Romans chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When the Lord becomes a part of your life, your perspective changes. Your priorities change. You see things differently. I've learned that in life, in seasons of life, your priorities and your perspectives change. I remember when we got married, I quickly learned The life that I lived before marriage and after marriage was not the same thing. The way I organized my clothes, the meals that I ate, the cleanliness of my home, all of these different things change when you get married. You see life through a different lens because you now walk in this intimate relationship together and and you're learning how to communicate and how to navigate through life and your perspectives change, your priorities change through marriage and then kids come. And it changes even more. And your priorities are different because now there's little walking tornadoes uh, running around, having fun and, and, and being incredible blessings in your life. Uh, they're, they're wonderful. I love my children. Don't take that as I, I love my babies. But your priorities change. Your perspectives change. The things that you're trying to grow in in your relationship with the Lord change. Patience becomes the number one thing that you are trying to achieve in your relationship with Jesus. As seasons of life change, as your exposure to different moments and opportunities and things change, your perspective and your mind changes on the way you see things. And I've learned this, that when Christ becomes a part of your life, everything changes. Your priorities are completely shifted because now you don't see through the lens of the temporary, of the material world. You see the lens through eternity. And now Christ doesn't become the first on your priority list. I want you to fix this in your mentality. He doesn't become number one because that means there's a a number two. That means there's a close second. What we do as believers is we don't just make Christ the first on our priority list. We make him the center of everything. Which means in priority one through 10, he's now involved. He's involved in everything you do. He's involved in the way you see people, in the way you speak to people, in the way you treat your spouses, in the way you treat your children, in the way you treat your coworkers, in the way that you walk and talk and work, your work ethic. When Christ becomes a part of you, when you are called to life and you are found in that hope that is in heaven, and we saw this in chapter eight, you are now working and seeing things through the lens of your spirit and no longer your flesh. So I want to challenge you today. I'm gonna go there because I care that you reside in heaven for eternity. If your life Life didn't change after you said, oh, yeah, I'll do, I'll, I'll have a relationship with Jesus. I want you to question if those seeds really took root in your soul. Because it's not just okay for us to pass by in hopes you can know that you know that you know, and we'll give you an opportunity to do that in just a moment, that we must see the way God sees. We must feel the way God feels. Our hearts must break for the things that break his. We must have a transformed heart that creates a heart that beats in line with God's. We must fall in love with God's people. As we read in chapter 9 of Romans in the first five verses, we see Paul's great love for God's people. Let's read it together. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel, chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them. He gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. He is God, and the one who rules over everything is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Paul's writing to this church in Rome, and from chapters 1 to 8, he's navigating this relationship that's built upon the law, and now how Christ has paid the price so that we are no longer bound by the law, but we are able to walk in a grace-based relationship with him. What does that mean? That means you don't have to be perfect in order to go to heaven. How many people are grateful for that? Amen. 
that it's no longer about your perfection, it's about his. And he clothes you with his cloak of righteousness, and now you walk in a relationship with him, and you inherit the gift of grace that comes through the sacrifice of his son. He goes from that in chapters 1 to 8 to now in chapter 9, he's talking about the Israelites. He's walking through this memory lane of the exodus of when the Israelites escaped the Egyptian slavery and as they were running from the Egyptians and they were onward onto this mission to find the promised land for 40 years, a journey that should have taken two days, took decades for them to be able to inherit the promises of God. Well, what happened between the beginning and the end? Well, there was a whole lot of trusting themselves, of missing it, of being close, but not quite, of knowing who God was and knowing what he does. Even Paul said that they, he gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promise. Their ancestors were the three people who were most known in their community for their relationship with Jesus. They saw miracles. They saw his wonder-working power. He had a covenant with them, yet they still missed it. Because what I've learned over just my few short years of life and as a believer is that sometimes we can be close, but not close enough. Because we know that close only works in horseshoes and hand grenades. They were close, but they didn't embrace the Father. This is how I kind of explained it. This has a lot to do with my testimony that I, I went to church and I did all the right things and I was near to God when it came to proximity, but there was no real rooted connection with him in my own life. I was close to God, but I did not embrace him. You see, they were close, but they did not embrace him. Many times they get caught up in the what ifs. The Israelites were running from the Egyptians after the plagues came and after they finally were let go by Pharaoh and, and God's people were released and Moses was on this mission and leading them out of slavery, they came to a dead end and it was the Red Sea. And the first thing that they begin to do, they just experience freedom from the Egyptians, but they know the Egyptians are on their way, is they begin to say, well, what if we just went back to Egypt? We are better off being slaves beaten, treated poorly under the oppression of an Egyptian ruler than to be here stuck in front of the Red Sea. And they sort of say, well, what if? And they doubt God's sovereignty and begin to dream up of what it would look like if they were in control again, and they miss it. But what happens next? Pillars of fire fall from heaven. I don't know about y'all, but that'd be a pretty cool thing to see. You're hoping somebody packed the s'mores and the, cho the chocolate and the grain. The, a giant pillar of fire fall from, falls from heaven and separates them from the Egyptians. And then they turn around, and what do they see? The Red Sea begins to part and lift, and Moses is standing out there with his staff in the water. And you just went from doubting God to what is going on. I don't know about y'all, but that's like a sensory over one side, pillars of fire, the other side, seas are part. You, this, the God always shows up, but they keep going back. Every time doubt creeps in, they start to want to take control again. Every time things got difficult and got harder, they wanted to pull back the steering wheel and say, okay, well, what if we, we did this on our own? Because they were close, but they didn't truly trust and embrace the Father. And my challenge to you is don't be this person who proclaims belief in Jesus but doesn't embrace him. The person who calls him God but doesn't allow him to be your spiritual father that doesn't allow him to play the role of savior and king and healer. We can be close. There's so many people that I fear that will go to church for decades, that will do the things they're supposed to do and say the things that they're supposed to say. But when they stand before the Father, he will say, depart from me for I never knew you because you can know the name of Jesus and not know his heart. You can be around somebody and never be friends with them. You go to work every day and there's probably a person in your office that you see all the time, but that's the one person you don't really know and it's because you don't really care to. We can be around people 
and feel so alone. We can be around people and never walk in a relationship. And, and, and sometimes even marriage gets that way where you're passing and you're roommates and you don't know each other. Or family members don't know each other anymore. And I know them. We may be Facebook friends, but we don't really walk in a relationship. I want to encourage you. Don't just settle for almost. Don't settle for close enough. Embrace the Father. He has greater for you. He wants to show you his mighty works, his love for you, his grace for you, his hope for your life. We cannot settle for just close but not quite. We can't get caught up in the what ifs. I think there's a lot of people who are here today who even say what ifs when it comes to being a part of the church. Well, you know, if I had money, I would give the journey. If I had time, I would serve. If I wasn't so busy at work, I would read my Bible more. And we start to make excuses in the what ifs. And God doesn't care about the total. He doesn't need to give you to give thousands of dollars for him to be like, oh, my child did something. He doesn't need you to serve every single Sunday for here for both services every single week to say, oh, they, they've got my heart. He just wants you to give him what you've got. He wants your obedience. He wants your heart. It's not about a number. It's not about an amount of time. It's about giving God your heart because when you give him your heart, he will reveal to you what the rest looks like. Don't settle for close enough that if I had a bigger house that I'd be happier. If, this, if I wasn't so busy at my job, my marriage would get better. Stop saying what if and figure out what you can do. Figure out the steps that you can take to spend more time with each other. If you're too busy for God, then you've got too many things going on in your life. He's the first. He's the forefront. But oftentimes we try to fit him in wherever we have a gap, and that's not the correct heart. This is, this is God's. This time is the Lord's. And everything else will follow. Don't settle for close enough. Paul was heartbroken because the Israelites had seen the works of God. They had seen his miraculous power. They had been freed from Egyptian slavery. They had been given a great promise. They had a great inheritance, and they still settled for close enough. Paul had a great passion for them that he said, I would rather be cursed and cut off from God for them to be able to find him. That's a bold statement that I would rather be completely removed from God and burn in hell for eternity just so that they would turn to him. Paul has a great love for these people, and these people didn't always have a great love for Paul. And Paul didn't always have a great love for them. If you didn't know this, Paul, the writer of this book, used to be a Christian murderer. Paul, before his name was changed, was Saul. And he was the leader in arresting and persecuting and killing Christians who proclaimed Jesus as Lord. But then he met God at Damascus Road. His life was transformed and his heart began to be in rhythm with the Father. And it shows us no matter how far you were from God, he wants to embrace you and change your heart. And Paul's heart begins to beat in rhythm with the fathers and his love for these people shows that, that he would be okay with being cursed and cut off from God for them to find a relationship with him. He's willing to do anything for other people to find Jesus. Listen, if all of us in this house had that kind of heart, I don't know where people, uh, there would, every church would have to do a building program. Every church, just in Harrisburg, our little town alone, 20 one, 22,000 people now. Where are they all going to go to? Everybody's going to be doing seven services. Because we are so passionate about people finding Jesus. Because that is the heartbeat of the Father. That the lost would be found. That the broken would be healed. That the hopeless would find hope and be restored in Jesus. Because that's the experience that you and I have had. And that's what they need. Romans chapter 9, let's go to verse 6 through 12. Well then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No, for not all who are born in the nation of Israel are truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scripture says, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Though Abraham had other children too, this means Abraham's physical descendants aren't necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promise are considered to be Abraham's children. 
For God had promised, I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. This son was our ancestor, Isaac. When he married Rebekah, she gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. And this message shows that God chooses people according to his own purpose. He calls people, but not according to their good and bad works. And she was told, your older son will serve your younger son. There's this whole dynamic that's brought up in this passage of the story of Abraham. So Abraham had no children. Abraham was an older gentleman. Sarah was an older lady. And God came in one day and said, next year I'll be back and you'll have a child. And they both, huh, what? Are you sure about that? They come back. God comes back. And what happens? At this point, they're promised a lineage that's a descendants as numerous as the stars. And they're given this promise that they will inherit the promises of God, that he will be the father to God's chosen people. But then Paul comes back into the scripture and says that not all of Abraham's children are actually children of God. So you can be related to him, but not inherit the promises that were spoken over his descendants. What is the separation? It's because it's one thing to be related to somebody by blood. It's another thing to play the role as the children of God. Because you can claim Christ as your daddy, but if you don't let him be your father, it doesn't mean anything. If we say we want the benefits of him being our father... We want heaven, we want healing, we want the miraculous, we want all of these things. But if we do not play the role as a child of God, then it doesn't mean anything. That some people can claim something, but they will miss the inheritance because that's not where their heart truly lies. That we must have the DNA of the Father. How do you know if somebody is your father? Well, you check their DNA. You do the test. And I want you to examine your heart and says, does the DNA of my soul align with the heart of God? Does the way I live my life, the way I think about things, the way I treat people, the way that I spend my time, does it align with the heart of God? Do a DNA test on yourself because it's not just about claiming Christ is Lord. It's that believing in your heart that he died on the cross for you. It says boldly proclaim that Christ is Lord, but believe in your heart that he died on the cross for you. It's one thing to say that Christ is Lord. It's another thing to live a life that reflects his lordship. I want you to ask yourself this question. If you didn't tell your friends, if you didn't tell your coworkers, if you didn't tell your boss, anybody around you that you were a Christian, would they know it anyways? You didn't post it on your Instagram as child of God. This, I mean, this is mine. I'll pick up myself. Follower of Jesus, husband to Crystal, daddy to Harper and Henley. If I didn't post that in my bio and post scriptures on my captions and all of these things and tell people, yeah, I believe in Jesus, would they know that I believe in Jesus by the way that I live my life without even telling them? Because when you carry the DNA, when you carry the heartbeat of Christ, the way you love people changes, the way you talk to people changes, your work ethic changes, the level of responsibility changes, because you are to do all things for the glory of God. Even the little things change. Do you carry the D and A of Christ? There's often times that I'm with my children and I say, yep, that's my daughter. And other times that I'm like, I don't know whose kid that is. Sometimes she carries the personalities and repeats the things of her parents. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know where you got that from, but that wasn't my house. And you need to take that back to wherever it came from. Are you reflecting the DNA and the life and the love that Jesus has for his church? Is the way that you love people reflecting his heartbeat because you were created in his image? Look to the person to your right and say, you were created in his image. To your left, beautifully and perfectly created. What's amazing to me is this passage applies to everyone in the room, yet all of us look different. All of us sound different, speak differently. All of us can seem different on the outside, but it means that every person here and on earth 
was created in the image of the Father. It says this in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth, and the small animals that scurry on the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Because the Israelites were the carriers of the promise that we were created in the image of God. That's something that's exciting. That's like, wow, I was created. I was knit, formed in my mother's womb. I, I was created by God. He knows the number of hairs I have on my... He did everything intentionally that you were created in his image. So we must reflect the image that God has created. We do not want to distort the image that God built because oftentimes we won't just do that to ourselves, but we'll do that to other people. That when you come against other people, you are coming against the creator of God, the creator of the universe. God made them just like he made you. So when you come against them and gossip about them and talk junk about other people, you're coming against their designer. Let me say it like this. I'm not a very artsy person. Any art people in here, like you can paint, draw, do anything like that. Art people are usually type B and they don't want to raise their hands in public, so that's fine. We got you. I can draw stick figures. I can draw a ninja, and that's about it. It's, it's bad. So when I go to look at art, they're not going to ask me to go to a museum to critique art because I'm either going to know what it is or I'm going to call it abstract because when it doesn't make sense, it's just abstract art. But when I come to an art museum, let's say, and I look at a picture and I critique the painting, I'm not critiquing the canvas. I'm not cre critiquing the, the paint that's on the walls because it didn't choose to be there. What I'm critiquing is the one who created it. So when you're coming against other people, you're not critiquing who they are. You are creating, you are critiquing their designer. That, this is why it frustrates me so much when we've got a bunch of Christian Karens all over Facebook coming after each other. Because number one, you're critiquing the God who made them. Number two, you are showing what the image of God looks like. You are portraying it through the way you live your life to other people. So if all you're doing is chalking junk to people and arguing with everybody, well, they're looking at you and saying, well, this is the image of God I've been told, so this is what it must look like. What kind of image are you drawing? What kind of image are you creating? Because there's people watching you. You may think, well, I'm not around people all the time. People watch. People notice things. Going through the grocery stores and doing things, they, they, they notice things. And if people around you and your family know you have a relationship with God, then you are creating what that image looks like for them. So they're equating what it must look like by the way that you live your life. What kind of image are you creating? God has a plan. We must reflect his heartbeat. We must reflect his DNA because just because we call Christ Lord doesn't mean we allow him to play the role as our Savior. Romans chapter 9, the next few verses. Let's skip to 18. So you see God chooses to show mercy to some and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Well then, you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes him do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created to say the one who created it, why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, he doesn't have a right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage in it. In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those whom his anger falls who are destined for destruction, who does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for his glory. I've learned this in my life through the short years that I have lived. God always has a plan. God always has a plan. The Bible says that we make a plan and the Lord directs our steps. What I call that is autocorrect. Life autocorrect. That we go one direction, the Lord's like, ah, baby, that ain't it. And he tries to direct your steps back to the path that he's created 
when a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the same right to use the lump of clay to make one for decoration and another to throw garbage into as we talk about being this image of God? And you look at this example of pottery. I can tell you this. If you put a, a mound of clay on one of those things, you can tell I'm not a potter. And it starts spinning around in circles. And you tell me, all right, I want you to make a jar. Something bad's going to happen. Someone's going to have to clean up a mess. We're going to have to cover the room. and sur- It's going to look like a crime scene because Pastor West put his hands on something. He has no clue what he's doing. If I'm there and I'm trying to create something and shape something and mold something that I don't know how to do it. I have no experience. I, I haven't been versed in pottery if I was to stand there and to try to form something that would look really great it probably wouldn't turn out so good but when you put someone who knows what they're doing the one who's understanding how the clay works how to make it be moldable how to spin the wheel just enough to where you can actually control it and it doesn't turn into chaos when someone who knows what they're doing has their hands on it it can turn into anything and I've learned this in life Oftentimes, we, we, all the time we are that clay. We are the one being molded and shaped by either the world or by God. Oftentimes, we try to put our hands to control our own life, and then we try to make a tiger, and it turns out to look nothing like a tiger. And we put our hands on our own life, and we try to turn it into something beautiful because we want to control it. And it turns out not to look anything like you expected because you were never designed to play the role of the potter. You are the clay. What we must do as believers, as people of God, is we don't say, here, let me fix this. Let me just take over this situation. We say, God, I'm here and I am ready to embrace you, shape me, mold me, cut away the edges that don't belong, turn me into something that I could never create on my own. And when you embrace the Father, you see a level of beauty in your life you could never find alone. When you are allowing yourself to be shaped by God, when you spend time with him, when you let him invest into your soul, you find yourself being turned into something you could have never done on your own because you weren't designed to be the potter. You weren't designed to make the steps. You were designed to follow in obedience the life that God has called you to live. And we must allow him to play that role of the potter. One of my favorite movies of all time is The A-Team. And I know some of the older folks in the room is like, that's not the real A-team. Well, it is to me. Because Liam Neeson is, is every father in here. I have a very specific set of skills. And at the end of the movie, the mission, every single time, Every single time, no matter how much chaos, no matter where it was, no matter what happened, no much, how much destruction, Liam Neeson always at the end of the movie says, I love it when a plan comes together. There was always a plan. No matter how chaotic it seemed, no matter how difficult it got, no matter how much it felt the odds were against them, there was always a plan. And can I encourage you, that is what God is speaking over your life today. No matter how difficult it seems, no matter how hard it is right now, God is telling you there is always a plan. And we love to get on the other side of it. And he says, I love it when the plan comes together. Are you allowing God to plan? Are you giving him space to mold, to shape your life, to change you, to shift your heart, to look more like him and less like the world? Are you allowing him to embrace you? Are you embracing God? Are you actually spending time with him? Are you just doing the things that you're told you're supposed to do in hopes of heaven? You can leave knowing that you know that you know that you can embrace the Father. Would you stand with me, Ben? Come and help me close the last two verses I want to read in Romans chapter 9 and verse 32 through 33 say this. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of trusting him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path, and God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Paul is 
talking to this church of Rome about this journey through the Israelites. And he continues this in chapter 10 and 11. And how much they missed it when it was right in front of them. That God was moving, that his power was shown, that his glory was made known. But they, they just missed it because they kept going back to what they were doing. They kept stumbling over the same thing over and over and over again. And in this part of the scripture, it says that Jesus said that he would put a stone in Jerusalem that would make people stumble, that would figure out if they're just doing what they're told to do or they truly trust in him. And what I want us to do just for a moment is I want us to do some introspection. I want you to look within and, and figure out what is the thing or things that are making you stumble. The things that are keeping you from allowing God to play the role of the potter and you the role of the clay. The things that are keeping you from embracing the Father and not just settling for almost or close enough. What are the things in your life that are keeping you from bearing the image and the heart that God has called you to have? I want you to close your eyes all across the room right where you are. They're gonna sing this chorus just for a moment and I want you to do some introspection because I never want you to leave the house without a challenge for yourself. Without something to take away so that you could look more like Jesus and less like the world. But if you're here today, I, I want you to take this moment, dive deep into your heart, truly understand what your heart is beating for. What are your passions? What are the things that are driving you? And it's good to have passions and hobbies and all of those things. But if it comes before the Father, then the clay, who we are, isn't shaping up to the way he wants us. But every day we can come before the Father and say, you know what, God? I've been going the wrong direction, but I want you to create me into the shape, into the person, into the child that you call me. So just for a moment, I want you to close your eyes and diagnose those things in your soul. What are the things that make me stumble? How can I remove my hands from the clay so that God can shape me into who I'm supposed to be? Just spend a moment with him as we sing this chorus over us. No longer I who live, but Christ in me. For I've been born again, my heart is free, the hope of heaven before the grave behind, hallelujah, you brought me back into what he's designed you to be and that's someone who walks in a relationship with him there's only one place you find purpose there's only one place you find joy there's only one place you find peace and healing and freedom and it's in a relationship with Jesus that things don't become perfect but you now have an answer and his name is Jesus and if you're here I, I want to encourage you every single one of us will stand before God the Father one day and he will say one of two things He'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you, or well done, my good and faithful servant. And in that moment, your eternity will be sealed. How do I hear 
well done, good and faithful servant. Well, the Bible says to boldly proclaim Christ as Lord and to believe in your heart that he died on the cross for you. And if you have not taken those steps, a bold proclamation and allowing him to invade your soul, I want today to be your day because I don't want anybody to leave here without knowing that you know that you know that your eternity resides in heaven with the Father. You don't have to leave without a doubt. It comes in proclaiming Christ as Lord and walking in a relationship with him. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, Pastor West, that's me. I need to know. I need to walk in a relationship with him. What I'm going to do is we do, I'm going to count to three. And I want you to raise your hand. And I know immediately some of us need to make that bold proclamation. And we're thinking, well, there's people looking around. Absolutely. But it's not to discourage you. It's not to gossip about you. It is to celebrate with you because we have to make this decision too. To choose Jesus. To embrace the Father. So if that's you and you need to know where your eternity lies on three, I want you to raise your hand so that we can pray over you and celebrate with you. One, two, three three. Pastor West, I need to know where my eternity is. I want it to be in heaven with the Father. I want to walk in a relationship with him. I've got you, ma'am. Hallelujah. I've got you, brother. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we celebrate with those two who chose life today? Amen. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family. You were a part of the fam. Now you're a part of the family of God. And we're so excited for you to make that decision. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. At the end of this service, when we dismiss, I'm going to have some people over here in this corner, right here, my best fan of white, over here on this side. And we have a book that we want to give you, and we just want to pray over you. We're not going to ask you for a list of, of things. There's no qualifications. We just want to have a conversation because we need to walk through life together. And the same way it takes people to surround you to raise a child, it takes people to surround you to walk in that relationship with the Father. So I would love, love, love for you two just to come over here and meet some people so we can give you some resources. We're so grateful for you to choose Jesus today. That's why we do what we do. Amen. God, thank you so much for who you are and what you've done, how you've moved in our life. We give you all the praise and all the glory for what you're doing and what you have yet to do. For you alone are worthy of the praise. We embrace you today in Jesus' name.